I'm going to talk a little bit about two simple but useful concepts when implementing uh, advanced control on distillation columns. Uh, and uh, go ahead and go to the next one. There, I'm going to talk about internal reflux control and then how to use it, and then the need for process identification models when using analyzer feedback for composition control and then how to implement those models. So let's review, and by the way, we're talking about light ends distillation, just you know, one overhead product, one bottom product, simple light ends distillation. Maybe in a future talk, uh, Scott, we could do some other complex sure. distillation, like crude, crude oil distillation. Okay. <clears throat> so this is like distillation 101. Typically, we talk about degrees of freedom or uh, independent variables or manipulated variables. And so typically on a, on a distillation column, you'll have five. The reflux, the overhead product, the uh, bottom product, the rebar heat input, and then something, some way to control the pressure. And you need three of those for inventory control. You need to control the inventory and the reflux accumulator and the column bottom. And then you need somehow to control the pressure because the pressure is really kind of an inventory. So what are you left with in a typical distillation column? You've got two degrees of freedom left, and those are typically the, the, uh, the reflux and the uh, reball heat input. And so what do you do with those? Because if you've got two, minute, two independent manipulated variables, you can control two things with them. And so, well, you can say, well, why don't we control the overhead product composition and bottom, bottom product composition? That theoretically, that's a nice idea, but in reality, it's kind of hard to do because to, con to control both compositions really requires a unique solution of the energy and material balance of the distillation column. So in reality, it's, it's very difficult to do. So we'll typically try to control one product composition tight and then, and then maybe control a separation variable like a reflux to feed ratio. Or we might try to control the other product composition, but just not try to control it real tight, let it, let it swing more. So let's go to the next slide. So why internal reflux control? Well, the reflux temperature, the reflux can be subcooled. And so the amount of sub, subcooling can vary. So for example, if you have a rainstorm, you have an air fan condenser and you have a rainstorm, all of a sudden your reflux temperature is much cooler. So now the reflux, the external reflux going to the tower is all of a sudden a lot cooler. Say, well, what difference does that make? Well, subcooled reflux adds additional internal reflux because when it comes in the tower, it's it's below its its uh, bubble point, so it takes heat to heat it back up to vaporize it. Where does that heat come from? Well, it has to condense vapor coming up from the trays below it, so that vapor condenses and becomes more internal reflux. So the more subcooled the reflux is, the more actual internal reflux you have in the tower. And that's a disturbance to the tower because anytime you change the internal reflux, you're changing the vapor to liquid ratio in the tower, and you're changing the separation in the tower, which will upset the composition. So, you, so in order to stabilize your product composition, the internal reflux needs to be stabilized. So, how do you do that? Go to the next one. So, uh, the chemical engineers in here will recognize it. That it's just a matter of, t of considering the heat capacity and the heat of vaporization. This is a latent heat. This is the heat of vaporization. You can calculate the internal reflux from the external reflux and the reflux temperature and the internal <coughs> temperature. So, all you need to do to control the internal reflux is just to invert that equation. And it'll calculate the external reflux required to keep your internal reflux constant. When the, when the reflux temperature is changed. So if we go to the next slide, and it's very simple to do with, with advanced control. You just, you have a control for internal reflux, and then you can reset that with your tray 17 temperature like we were trying to do in that original slide that I showed. So that's, that's an example of how you use uh, internal reflux. And then you go to the next slide. Oh, it's hard to see this. <coughs> This, this is from a project we did in Germany in the late 90s, 99. It's old, but it's still very uh, useful. This is a debutinizer. And here, um, uh, this is the internal reflux controller. It's adjusting the external reflux to the tower. 
Notice that the overhead temperature is 56 degrees uh, centigrade, while the reflux temperature is 29. So that's a, what, 25 degree difference at subcool reflux. So the, the, the internal reflux is 114 cubic meters per hour, whereas the external reflux is 104. So we've got 10 cubic meters an hour of extra reflux being provided because this, this reflux is so cool. This is a constraint control application. The, where the, the, these constraints may limit the internal reflux. This is a maximum valve, uh, steam valve position over here. This is a maximum uh, overhead pressure. This is a maximum internal reflux to prevent flooding in the tower. And then here we have the tray 19 temperature adjusting the internal reflux to control the composition. So that's an example of how you use internal reflux on, a, on an operating um, UBMS. So let's go to the next, next slide. So let's, let's talk about process identification models now and, and why it's needed. So let's go back to this, the propanizer. We have this uh, analyzer for the isobutane in the overhead. We, that analyzer is a gas chromatograph. It, the way gas chromatographs work on, on a, in a real operating plant is you have a, an analyzer loop that takes a sample out of the overhead product stream. It runs it down to an analyzer house, which may be 200, 300 feet away from the tower, runs it through a sampling system, and the loop goes back up and puts it back in the product stream. There's a loop. And, and then once it's, it takes a little sample out of that loop and injects it into the gas chromatograph, which has got a long column of, of, of absorbent that separates the, the components, and then you finally get a reading of the peaks. And so it'll tell you how much IC4 is there. The problem with that is you have a long dead time and lag between the time that the sample was taken and when you actually get that result. You can't just do plain old PID feedback control with that because it's, it's just been delayed by 30 45 minutes. So what do you do about that? Well, you, you develop what's called a process identification model, and you look for something in the tower that you can that you can identify it with. And what you identify with is you identify it with that tray 17 temperature. So what you want to do is you want to get a model between when the sample was taken and what the temperature was doing at the time the sample was taken. So we'll go to the next slide. So is the analyzer really telling us the composition uh, of the overhead product right now? No, it's what it, it's what it was when the sample was taken. So how can that reading be used? So we associate it with, the, with this variable, the tray 17 temperature. So the next slide. So we need a time-adjusted relationship. And so what's easy to use is just a pure dead time and simple first order lag model. That works just fine to delay the, the temperature so that you line up the temperature and the analyzer in the time. And typical, typical values are like a dead time of 30 minutes and a lag time of 15 minutes or something like that. And if you analyze enough data between the analyzer and the temperature, you get like a month's worth of data and you progress it. You, you, can, you can get that, you know, you can do kind of trial and error with the dead time and the, and the lag. And then you can get them to line up in time. So if we go to the next, next slide. So once you get it lined up, you just get a real simple linear relationship between the delayed temperature and the analyzer reading. So when you get a new analyzer reading every 15 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you validate it first by applying, uh, you know, analyzer uh, validation, you know, has it moved too much, has it moved at all, you know, once you validate it, then you, then you calculate the predicted composition from your equation, which is, you just uh, invert that equation. Then you compare it to the analyzer reading, and then you have then you have rules to decide. Okay, what do I do? Do I use PID on it, or do I use <coughs> uh, just integral action or gain action? But but anyway, you you use some kind of feedback control based upon that and the analyzer reading and the predicted <coughs> what the predicted composition would be, and then based upon that you calculate and download a new temperature set point, and then you update your bias in this group in this uh, simple. So that's how you use a uh, uh, process identification model uh, with, with GC analyzer. So we go to the next slide. So back to this slide. And in, in, in this case, this is the uh, overhead product uh, isobutane content, uh, the, the overhead butane product, SQL product. And we use the process identification model in this control. 
And I lied to you a while ago because I said that you couldn't do composition control on both ends of the tower, but it looks like we were controlling the C4s in the, bo in the bottom screen here. But I think, I think what we were doing the is... The C4s were more important, so we had that as the... There we go. I think this is my application. The, the C4s were running all the time, but the uh, IC5s could, uh, could get overridden by all of those. So we were maximizing to the point of midnight so far, but we couldn't. We just ran as close to it as we could on the other constraints. This was more just a separation maximization strategy up here, right? Yeah. This was to try to work the tower as hard as you could, uh, moving it as close to either uh, your valve position on your steam or your uh, maximum uh, traffic in the tower. But this was more important. Is that right? <coughs> yeah. You were there. Yep. I built that each mile. Hey, listen, 99, that's what we had to work with. We had CRP. Did you your eyes, Chris? I think that's it. Okay. Did I, did I, no, the other one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you think, did I hold yeah. it down to 15 minutes? Yeah, I got questions. <laughs> so, we'll start. Um, typically, like the way we've been changing the format is we do kind of posted interview thing. Um, I mean, I've, I've got a couple <coughs> questions about what you did, and I'm <coughs> fairly familiar with it, not questions. So, I'm just going to kind of, I kind of want to recap a few things. Re reflux. Reflux is this flow going back into the column, right? Mm -hmm. And typically, the more reflux you have, the purer your thing coming out of the top. Okay. Correct. So, and then you were saying, so you have a certain amount that you're flowing this way, but if this is colder than the vapor coming out the top, it's going to condense more vapor and you'll have more internal mm -hmm. reflux. Right. Now, what you lost me was, you said, you you're trying to maintain a, a constant reflux here, and, and by adjusting the amount of reflux here, is that the when the reflux temperature changes? Okay. That's, that's a disturbance. Okay. But that's a so for example the the, the rainstorm. Right. That's a disturbance. If if you don't do anything, if you just keep the reflux coming in at, at this constant rate, okay, that will produce more internal reflux. Okay. Which, will, which is a disturbance variable to the tower. The, the, the vapor liquid traffic will change. Gotcha. You'll have more liquid going down. You'll be condensing more vapor, less vapor coming up. So you'll, you'll, you'll get purer in overhead product, gotcha. but you'll end up dirtying up the bottom of the column by, by doing that. Okay. So, so, Scott, if you think of it from a temperature standpoint, when the rain hits the air fan and the reflux comes in colder, if you don't do anything and you just leave it on a regular flow set point, going to come down and drop that tray 17 temperature, which um, you know correlates to your, your overhead composition. Right. So the internal reflux, if it gets colder, it just cuts back on the flow. Okay. So you send less in, mm -hmm. but you end up holding that tray 17 temperature. Yeah. More Without the internal reflux control, yeah. you'd have to wait for that tray 17 to notice a drop in temperature <laughs> and then start trying to grind away on the reflux to get to right. bring the temperature back up. Okay, and that's a long lag between the top of the tower and tray 17. So, okay, that, that's, a, that's a very difficult control if it's that tray 17 and the reflux. Is, uh, that's a long dead time in my Okay, so you would still, you would still in some ways have this tray 17 setting a reflux flow. Mm -hmm. It just wouldn't be directly this flow. Right, it'd be it would setting the internal, be the amount of that's coming down. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Well, there's a slide.
clear sense, right? It's going to take a while for this this analyzer to read, so you're going to have some a time to, a, a time difference. Now, when, so when I first when you were talking about that, I was thinking, okay, well, let's just do delay. When you know this temperature is, then ten minutes later, when the analyzer reads, it's a delay. But when you described it, you talked about a dead time and kind of and a delay. So it's it's a little more complicated than just moving it in time. Theoretically, the dead time is the time it takes from the sample to get from the sampling point to the to the GC. Okay. And the, the lag is when it goes through that chromatograph column. To it, 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 okay. It, it, I mean that's that's the way you can look at it. All right. So it all has to do with does it all have to do with the analyzer, or does it have to do with the fact that it's purely a changes in it's temperature? Purely. So as oh. soon as this temperature is that the composition. Is what it records. <coughs> you're just delaying for the analyzer. No, you're also delaying for the process piping to get it to the sample point. So, yeah, the yeah, the but, 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 but that all, all has to do with measuring. What I, what I mean is, if you if you could know, you know, this is my composition, right? Not not piping delays, not the analyzer, but at a temperature in here. Yes, if I knew, if I could, you know, if I had the X-ray vision, I could see my composition. That's it. Or do you also have to adjust for as this temperature is rising, my composition is changing? Let me give you another example. Sure. We do infer properties on like crude uh, crude columns. Yeah. The lab does samples. The lab will take a sample and they'll go run it. Okay. And eight hours later, the sample will appear at the operator console. We use those samples to update our inferred property mm -hmm. uh, calculations. We have software that goes back eight hours before and looks at the hourly averages of the variables at, at what they were eight yeah. hours ago when the sample was taken, and then we we, we do we we calculate what that inferred property mm -hmm. was then, and then we look at what the lab. Sample came, what the value is when it came in, and we compare those, and then we update our inferred property models based upon that. Sure. Well, all we did was is we, is we took into account the fact that the sample was taken eight hours ago, so we've got to go back in history eight hours ago to, to decide what to do with that sample. Right. That's the same. Oh, that's all we're doing here. Okay. It's, it's just a pure okay. sampling delay. Okay. So it's uh, it, that, and that was my question was if it was just sampling delay or if there was something in the column. No, that the, the that the temperature didn't instantly relate to that. Wouldn't where the like so here the analyzer is on you know, the accumulator, whereas if it was directly on the overheads, there would be no like so. If you imagine a step change in composition that happened instantaneously, then the composition of the accumulator is actually going to change slowly because there's an existing inventory. And to me, that would be more like what the first order lag was intended. That's sort of thing to, to damp it out, and then the the delay and the lag could both be affected if it was on the overheads as well. So where you're measuring the <coughs> process, I think, would have a huge impact on, on how you model that. Yeah. The problem is the temperature, a temperature up here <coughs> wouldn't be sensitive to composition. You've got to go down in the tower to get a temperature that's, that's right. sensitive to composition <coughs> because this is almost pure uh, Propane, so that doesn't change. If the, if the isobutane changes by 0.1 percent, that temperature doesn't change at all. The temperature that changes is the trace 17 because that's where the composition profile is changing in the column, and that's where you, that's that's why you correlate the trace 17 temperature of the composition and not the overall temperature. Of the composition. I have a part B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, would you? Okay, so another way I've seen this handled is the idea that it has some many names. It's like an event asynchronous, intermittent PID that basically recalculates the integral term based on how long it's been between the samples on the GC, which could be variable to some degree. Would you always use this method as opposed to that sort of asynchronous PID, which would only update the output when you get a new sample? Or would, would that? Your I think the asynchronous PID is used when the analyzer 
you're reading is real time. Right? Yes. Yeah, you know, it it needs to be pretty close to real time. Right. The reason it's designed is because you get step change responses. And you don't want to integrate while you're not when getting When you don't need to compensate for a long sample, mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. well, I've seen them used in cases where there's like 10 or 20 minute sample delay. So in your opinion, that would be a misapplication. Be and you'd be better off using something like this. Yeah. Plus, yeah. Where but, or, the, the one more comment. You should never do continuous PID control with a discontinuous input. You, you should only take control action with PID when you get a new reading. You, sit, you shouldn't sit there and integrate with when the PV is not changing because you're not getting a new PV. So to step step away from the technical details a little bit, this. Like this concept of reflex control, has that has that been around since there were columns? Was this always something, or is this something we dreamed up? Where did this where did it come from? How did, is this something you thought up when you did this project? I have to go back to this. I have to go back to my mentor for that. I, okay. I think that it was something that uh, came out of Exxon Mobil and uh, went back. I think Courtney brought that along. Okay. <coughs> you don't you don't see it a lot, but it's one of the simplest. Things you can do, the equation's not tough. You yeah. can get it out of parries, you get the constants out of parries and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it have some of the most immediate effects. So anytime you walk into a plant and somebody says, Well, it just started raining, and the operator's having to deal with that, probably having to deal with this situation. Yeah. It's a it's a heat issue, it's a change you know, change in the overall heat. So it's usually a big red flag that something could be done. The other thing we were talking about this morning, we should have talked about now, is pressure corrected temperature. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do that next time. We finally got the control action right, didn't we, didn't we Bill? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, any other questions? Anybody? Did everybody understand it? Ready to go do this? <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I'm, I'm, thank you, Jim. I appreciate you doing that. And, um, and like I said, thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Jim.